This is Robot Opera. It is the second in a series of events taking place over uh, the next couple of days on Monday and Tuesday of next week. The first of which is Robo Po, which is focused on poetry, and our event is focused on opera. Um, my role in this is director uh, only of the opera piece. The uh, poetry um, event is being organised by colleagues, and, and I'm directing the uh, event of the, um, of the robot opera. Uh, in this case, it's a strange job in many ways. Um, we, uh, Evelyn and I, when we were starting thinking about how to develop uh, this particular event, um, we thought of it in terms of studies. Uh, we thought there would be a, uh, a study or an exercise related perhaps particularly to movement There'd be one re related to singing, and there'd be another one related to, as it were, stage. Uh, so we were looking at thinking, treating the different expressive elements of opera, if you like, kind of separately. And then as we progressed, we thought, well, actually, maybe what we need to do is have a, um, is to try and imagine some sort of scenario in which the different expressive elements of opera could meet, some sort of story. Uh, and a lot of the time, in Evelyn's practice and in mine too, we're arguing for the idea that opera is a really broad spectrum of different practice. And, and although traditionally it's a form of narrative fiction drama performed on stage, we're often now arguing that it's a much broader spectrum than that. And it's, it can be other things. It can be things that are sometimes designated as other art forms. It, it can be things that look like installation or things that look like sound art. It can be many different things. In this case, because uh, the, uh, the event kind of announces itself as robot opera, we thought, well, we should probably face that idea of opera and, and face what that can also mean traditionally in terms of there being a story, there being a scenario, there being characters who are embodying representations of people and, and acting out with each other. One of the reasons this is uh, important is that, the, in a way, what we can do with this particular puppet is very similar to other kinds of theatrical traditions. In a way, um, the, the robot is a kind of puppet uh, through which we are enacting pre-decided uh, pre routines um, and through whose voice we are ventriloquizing potentially our own voice. So it connects to quite ancient traditions in a way. Um, the other thing about it is that uh, the convergence of different kind of art forms that opera traditionally is has always walked hand in hand through opera history as a, with, with a sense of technological adventure. So whenever it's been possible to do something new, usually opera has done it. Uh, and in a way, working with an opera, uh, with a, an automaton, is part of that story. The other thing about her situation um, is that uh, you can frame it in such a way that it connects to quite ancient roots of operatic interest. So, for example, in, this is an inanimate object um, that is designed in a way which is trying to convince us that it is a, a, a live object. So what if we imagined that it, it was really an inanimate object with a consciousness that wanted to become live? So we created a story whereby the um, uh, Janine, sorry, Cleo, the robot, wants to transition from the robot world to the human world. Um, and instead of um, thinking that she is the creation of humans becoming a more sophisticated machine, we imagine that she's the creation of machines becoming a more sophisticated human. Um, and that's the scenario. So, and it, then, then that bumps into other scenarios, some from kind of popular culture, some from, so to speak, high culture. Popular culture, it bumps into uh, many, many kind of sci-fi scenarios where um, some kind of m machine or artificial intelligence um, humanoid goes rogue in, in the human world and needs to be controlled in some way. Um, so there's a kind of long sci-fi tradition of that kind of story. But it also light, alights on very early stories because we're thinking about what it is for this robot to sing, for example. Is there a special claim that music making 
and storytelling through music making brings generally to opera and how does using an automaton that sings bring that, bring, bring that into focus in interesting ways. In a way, the journey from um, machine to human is a journey from death to life. It's a little bit like the, various, the very earliest opera stories. For example, um, the story of Orpheus, uh, which is a journey from life to death and hopefully back. So there's something that, about the story and the situation of the robot, if we imagine that it wants to come back to life, that connects in quite interesting ways to opera's traditional storylines. The other thing that's interesting is there's a whole load of repertoire, particularly in the 19th century, which is about, which represents um, the idea of desire, for example, as dangerous, particularly if women are expressing it. If you go back into earlier centuries, that changes, but particularly in the 19th century, and a lot of the repertoire where, which features uh, large leading solo roles for women, you often find in the 19th century that the storyline is something like, you know, someone falls in love with somebody, something or somebody they, they must not have, has to leave their element in order to achieve that, and then is destroyed by that experience. So we're sort of, we're looking at that too, because in a way, in our scenario, the robot leaves the robot world, transitions into the human world, and encounters what? So what, sh what we've done is to try and see the story as if from the robot's eyes, uh, and uh, we play with images of fruitful confusion about who the robot really is in space. So the Clio robot is duplicated by a singer robot who is also duplicated by a dancer robot. So there are moments at which these three different versions of the robot, one is humanoid, two are human, um, are bumping into each other and we're not sure who is the robot, and we're not sure who is leading whom, who is singing, who is ventriloquizing, who is moving, who is imitating, um, who is communicating, who is speaking, who is listening. So we play using the three similarly dressed but very different uh, presences uh, to uh, create musical possibilities. So there are, there is, there are, there are duet forms, there, are, there is a trio form, there are other things that you find in opera. You, the unusual situation you have in opera, which is not true of most spoken theatre, where people are singing at the same time, for example, you'll often get, that's common in opera, they're essentially speaking at the same time. Uh, so there's that kind of confusion, slightly deconstructed, and everything that happens within the stage space, for the sake of this experiment, because it is still just an experiment, really, it's not a last word, um, has some kind of auditory byproduct. The robot herself has a kind of uh, a kind of whirring, humming, buzzing set of sounds that she makes when she moves. Um, the room that we're in, which is a kind of you know a contemporary arts type space, it has its own auditory signature. All the equipment is humming and buzzing away. So we're in a kind of machine in here. Uh, and this is a machine too. So anything that kind of happens within the stage space is quite, uh, is, a, is a kind of helpful auditory addition. Along with the kind of idea of duplication, um, which is another, I suppose, robotic idea, there's quite a strong, there's, there's quite a sort of strong sense of replicant, there's a strong tradition of the idea of replicant, isn't there, in, in, in science fiction, in robotic science fiction. Um, is uh, we, we double images in the room. So there are some, there's a quite strong kind of architectural statement at that end of the room with two doors. So we're going to paint similar doors on the backdrop behind me, I hope if I get time. Um, and we, so we project different versions of the space into different places so that, the, so that the, this confusion about and mirroring is, is going on in the space as well. And what else is in it? There is, the, as well as, as, it, as it were, humanoid robots, we are parenthesizing that with other kinds of machine. We've talked about the, the room as a machine, but we also have little toy robots, which are called hex bugs, which were quite popular a few years ago. They're about the size of a toothbrush, and they kind of scurry around like cockroaches. So we have a moment where we have some of those as well. So that we also you know, suggest, well, in a, you know, and what are these creatures? They're sort of part of the robot world, but they're also, maybe they're in charge, you know, we just don't know. Maybe, maybe we are their experiment, not the other way around. 
Um, and the other, the other element in it are these um, sculptural uh, objects, these kind of mirrored surfaces. If I just, yeah, you can see them over there. Um, so it, it partly came up out of um, going back to this Orpheus idea and remembering that moment in the uh, Cocteau treatment of the Orpheus story from the 50s where the doorway from one world to another is the mirror in the wardrobe in the bedroom rather than the river sticks. And if you're mortal, if you're alive, you can't pass through the door, and if you're dead, you can pass through it. So it's sort of coming to do with that. And it's also kind of liquid in a way, but liquid frozen. Um, the uh, other thing is that the, 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 the robot uses uh, video cameras in its eyes uh, and is capable of facial detection, facial recognition, and spatial detection. Uh, and we can, uh, we can channel the robot's point of view. So we, in the performance, we also see the world from the robot's point of view. And we stage a moment at which we present Cleo with some of these mirrored surfaces, and she sees herself. Um, and there's something about a moment where you know, a robot sees and recognizes themselves, which is a kind of image you might find along the pathway towards consciousness for a machine. Now, we must be clear that the machine has no artificial intelligence capabilities at all, but we're imagining that she does. Uh, and we're pretending uh, in the story um, that that consciousness is kind of growing and sort of cracking open and, and moving her through a world in kind of in interesting exploratory ways. Um, where the world for an opera heroine, as it were, in 19th century opera might end very badly. Um, this robot echoes that in a way, but it's slightly subverted in that she leaves the constraints of the robot world, enters the freedom of what seems to be a human world, but we're never quite sure we're in that because actually what, who she meets are humans that look very similar to robots. At the end of that, um, at the end of the, this quite short piece, there is a, um, a section where uh, actually the world that she meets and the world that all the other humans are experiencing is quite banal. It's not the kind of nirvana of heightened e experience that um, Cleo has hoped it will be. It's actually quite routine and quite boring and in some ways a little bit robotic in the way we are, um, uh, in the way our agency is, is compromised, I suppose, by the social system we need to live in.